Hey, welcome back everybody. Today on my Vintage Irons channel, we're going to get into the next episode of the 351 Cleaver build. Some of you remember, uh, we started this series a while back. It's been a while. We are going to get into a bunch of the measuring and the blueprinting and the assembly of the 351 Cleaver short block. It's actually a 351 Windsor based block with Cleveland heads. It is a dart block and so it's actually going to be a 427 cubic inch stroker because we have a 4 inch stroke and a 4.125 bore on this dart block. It was 4 inches but we bored it out 125. We got a lot of good stuff coming up today. I hope you enjoy this. I'm going to get into a bunch of detail so I won't bore you anymore by talking. Let's get right into it. We've got all the cleaning done. The next step is to load the block into the spray wash cabinet. And then after we let it run in there for a while, uh, we will, I'll, I'll show you how to final wash this thing. So we're just gonna let that run. Once you run it through the chemical wash for a while, we're going to take it and rinse it. We got all of the honing debris and everything off of it, and we want to rinse it off and blow it dry with compressed air. So even after we go through the chemical wash, we need to make sure that we scrub this block with rifle brushes. Just like it's a baby, you got to give it a bath. And then of course we rinse it, and we put spray oil or WD-40 on it so it doesn't rust. So we want to get all of these areas with these big rifle brushes. We got smaller rifle brushes for a lot of the smaller holes. And you just want to scrub all these out really, really good. An engine is like a surgical operation. It's got to be super, super clean. All right, so now that we've got our block final washed and scrubbed with soap and water, we put spray oil on it so it wouldn't rust. We've got our upper bearings in here. These are our narrow cleavite coated bearings. We want to put some lube on these, some assembly lube, get some on the thrust there that's in the center. We've already checked all of our clearances on this engine. We got about two and a half to three thousandths clearance on the mains and we got between one and a half and two on the rods which is perfect. We've also final washed our forged crankshaft that we're going to put in here. Also your crankshaft, the oil holes need to be cleaned with a rifle brush and solvent, so we want to run this brush through there. And you really want to thoroughly scrub these. You don't want any grit or crud or grime in there. So we're gonna go through and we'll scrub all those oil holes. And then of course we'll final wash the crank again like we did with soap and water, just like the block. You saw earlier we were scrubbing the, the oil holes with a rifle brush, and we final washed it with soap and water just like the block, and now we are ready to install our crankshaft. You just wanna take your crankshaft, lay it gently down in there on the mains, set it in there evenly, don't drop this. Very gently install your crank, and there you go. Now we can get our caps on and torque them, and like I said, we've checked all the clearances on these so we know everything is really good on this motor. Now we don't have the rear main seal yet, I'm going to have to get that, but that goes in from the back because it's a one-piece rear main seal, which is not a big deal. So I like to put that on first, but since I don't have it, it's not an option. So we're going to go ahead and get the crank in. Make sure you put lube on all these journals, we don't want these dry. Put some good assembly lube on there. Now remember, the caps are directional. They have to go in a certain spot, and these are marked. This is a number three cap, which is our thrust bearing. You can see our thrust bearing is there. The bearing notches, which is the locating notch here, goes to the same side as the locating notch here. So this cap goes on just like that. And we'll put a little bit of assembly lube on that thrust surface just in case. Go ahead and start the bolts, but you don't want to tighten these yet. What we want to do is you want to seat the cap. And when I say seat the cap, 
What I mean is the cap sits in a tight pocket here and you want to make sure that it's all the way down flush. I've talked about that before. If not, you could damage the cap when you tighten these bolts. It's okay to get them started. But then we want to take a soft hammer and we just want to gently tap that cap down and, and visually verify, look at the cap here and here and make sure that it is flush down on the block before you tighten these. That one looks really good. So we'll get all the caps on and then I'll come back and we'll torque these. So now we get to piston and zoner wall clearance. Now if you'll, if you'll notice, if you'll notice what we've done here, these are the pistons that we had originally and of course it's set up for a cleaver, it's got the valve relief. Well, I ran into a problem off camera and it wasn't really a problem so much as an issue with compression ratio. The flat top piston that we got with our kit, once we ran the compression ratio numbers with the Edelbrock heads that we're using, the 4.125 bore and the 4 inch stroke, we came out to about 11.2 to 1 compression. In conversations with the customer, we made a decision that we were going to go with a different piston, mainly because he didn't want to have to put you know that's on the ragged edge of of having to use gasoline that's really expensive like race gas 108 octane or whatever 103 so what we did is we ordered another set of pistons same manufacturer trick flow but if you'll notice we've got a dish here now the dish that is built into this piston is going to give us just a little under 10 to 1 compression, which is perfect for pump gas, especially with aluminum heads. So I know a lot of you that are savvy will pick up on the fact that in the last video we did deck clearance, deck height, and we did it with the piston. I did recheck the deck height, and when you do deck height, you don't go to the dish, you go to the flat spot. So it ended up being the same thing. It, was, it would still be this flat spot. So we ended up uh, going with a, and, and it was kind of a hassle because these were already balanced with the rotating assembly. So I had to weight match the new pistons to the ones that we had balanced, but it wasn't bad. I only had a couple, I had to take a little bit of material off to get the, the weight correct. So, so we ended up getting them weight matched. All right, so the next thing we wanna make sure, and these are forged pistons, now, traditionally in the old days, with forged pistons, you had to run a lot of piston to cylinder wall clearance. Some like sometimes like six or seven thousandths, even up to eight thousandths clearance, depending on the fuel you used. The the clearances on the new pistons have gotten a lot tighter on even on the forged stuff. Uh, I've seen forged pistons. I did a, an LS motor where. It was a mall piston, and they said three and a half thousandths clearance for a forged piston, which that was years ago when I first experienced that, and that stunned me. And I like called them up and I said, are you sure about this? And they're like, yeah, you know, we've really improved our materials. We don't have to have gobs of clearance anymore. So the clearance specifications have gotten a lot tighter. The One of the things that we noticed with the older pistons that was kind of a phenomenon back in the day was if you had forged pistons, when the engine was cold, you had a lot of piston slap, piston noise. That was kind of normal for forged pistons. Nowadays, you don't really run into that too much. Uh, the newer piston technology and the metallurgy that they have, we run pretty tight clearances on it. They're a little, they're a little looser than what we, you would see with a cast or a hyperutectic piston, but they're way tighter, right, nowadays than they were. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, so the piston clearances on this are, are pretty tight. It's like three and a half thousandths. Um, and so we're gonna check piston to cylinder wall clearance. The way that we do that is we measure our bore. And we did measure the bore. Now the cylinders have been bored 125 thousandths out. So our bore size is 4.125. We need to mic our piston and see what we got here. So we're just gonna take our micrometer. You wanna mic this skirt in the middle. Now it does matter where you where you measure this. The skirt varies in size here. According to trick flow, I measured from the top down and the measurement that they gave me put me right about in the middle of that skirt. So I'm gonna go to the middle of the skirt and see what we got. Just very carefully mic the the diameter of that piston. 
All right, there we go. And I've got 4.121. 4.121, if we subtract the difference, that gives us four thousandths piston to cylinder wall clearance. Three and a half to four is acceptable on these pistons. So that's good piston to cylinder wall clearance. Now, of course, we're gonna check them all. And also you wanna measure your bore size. And of course, we did measure all of our bores on our engine. And we knew what they were anyway. So they were, they were 4.125 which is exactly what they came out to. So about four, four thousandths piston to cylinder wall clearance, we're happy with that. That does fall within the, the tolerances that trick flow requires for this. So uh, we're gonna check all those and make sure they're all right on the money. I won't do all that on camera. The next thing is we wanna check our clearances between our crankshaft and um, our oil clearances here between our bearing and our crank. So that's going to require you to install your bearing down here. And then of course once the bearing is installed in the big end of the connecting rod here, we're going to have to torque the cap on. So you want to take this cap off and you want to do all of these. We're going to do one for demonstration purposes but you want to check all your oil clearances. So these are our, our cleavite bearings here that we've got. And this is an HN bearing, which is a, a coated narrow bearing. It's narrower because of the wide radius on the performance crank. So you want to just go ahead and get your bearings in here. And of course, once your bearings are installed, put the cap on in the correct orientation. Remember the bearing tang locating notches, they go to the same side of the rod. So they don't necessarily line up with each other, but they're on the same side here. You want to make sure you get these on correctly. And then once you get the cap on here, you guys, you need to torque this to specifications. We're going to use a rod vise to do that. I don't recommend you put this in a bench vise. If you don't have a rod vise, it's probably a good idea to get one. So we're going to go ahead and torque the cap on here and once the cap is torqued on to spec then we'll go ahead and measure our ID here and we'll also compare that to the crankshaft so I'll get this torqued and we'll do that next We want to make sure that we get the get this in torqued in. It's a good idea to use a rod vise to do that. Once we get this torqued in, then we can compare the inside diameter of our bearing bore here with the bearing to our crankshaft. Okay guys, so we want to measure our crank journal here and get a reading on it. This is where this is our number one piston and rod assembly that we just torqued up. So we want to measure the crank right here at our number one position. So our crankshaft right here is reading 2.0985. So I've got my mic locked to a fixed position. You can use a vise with soft jaws or something to hold this mic. I like to use this holder here. It comes in real handy. So I know that I've duplicated the size of my crank journal here. So now what I need to do calibrate my dial gauge based on that specific size right there. So we'll just go ahead and put our dial gauge, the fingers of our dial gauge between here and then at that point we're going to zero our indicator. So now if you look at our indicator here, once I put it between the fingers of the mic, you can see that we have zeroed out our dial indicator. So what we've done is that we've duplicated the size of our crank journal right here with this on zero and now we take and we're going to put our dial bore gauge in here and we should see our clearance so now if i put the dial gate we put the dial gauge in here with this torqued up we should see our clearance so we'll go ahead and put this in go to the smallest point and if you look right there this is a five tenths indicator i have exactly two thousandths clearance on this on this journal that's good one and a half to two is good for the rods 
that's perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and check them all off camera. We'll get, make sure you get all of your clearances checked on your, on your, your, your oil clearance is checked on your rods. If you don't check this, you're gonna have problems, right? You gotta check every single one of them. You gotta mic every single journal here and you gotta get each one checked. So I'm gonna check each one based on what, what, uh, what rod I'm checking. So I'm gonna go ahead and check them all. And once we get that done, I'll come back and we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so another critical check that we're gonna make is our ring end gap. And I've talked about this before. The ring end gap is the gap at the end of the ring when the, the ring is installed in the bore. And what we've done is we've put our four top rings in here and I'll zoom in on one of these. Now, really important, you have to square that ring up. We're using a ring squaring tool that we got from uh, Total Seal. This has a step on it and it goes into the bore and you just pull your ring up against the bottom of that. And that does a good job of squaring the ring because if the ring is not square, you're gonna get a false reading here. So wh what you really want is about four and a half thousandths per inch of bore. We've got a 4.125 bore. Now we could have got file fit rings, but we didn't do that. We went ahead and got gapped rings for this because this is not really gonna be a, a race motor. But what we've done is we put this in there and check the gaps and all of our checks, uh, our gaps on this are right about 21 thousandths. So you want about four and a half thousandths per inch of bore. Four and a half thousandths per inch of bore on a 4.125 comes out to about 19 thousandths. We've got about 21 here. When I put the, that's the 21 there and it, it goes in and it's a little snug. If the, if the 22, we try to put the 22 thousandths in, it doesn't go. So we got a couple extra thousands, which is good because that just is a little extra insurance. You don't ever want the gaps to be tight because that can, especially if you're gonna run nitrous or something. If we were gonna run nitrous or a turbo motor or something, we'd get our ring file and we'd file these open. But since this is an NA motor, we're not gonna worry about that. Our minimum is about 19, we're sitting at 21. We're actually pretty happy with that. What you'll notice is if we, we've got all of our rings in here, these are all the top rings. The, the, the top ring that's gonna go in this cylinder on this piston needs to be checked in this cylinder. And then of course, this one here, this ring is gonna go on this piston, so it needs to be checked in that. So always check the gaps in the cylinder that that ring is gonna run in. And you gotta check all your tops and all your seconds. So we've got all our tops checked on this bank. It looks good. And now we're gonna take these off and we're gonna keep them in order with that respective piston. So we'll get all eight of these checked, uh, all the rings, and then, and then we'll come back and uh, we can start putting these rings and, and pistons together. Okay, so we've got all the ring end gaps checked, and as you can see, we've got our pistons uh, in order here. And we've got each ring pack with its respective piston where we check these in the bore. Now, uh, we need to go ahead and get the rings onto the pistons. Now that we know that the gaps are good, and we, we, everything looks good there, we wanna go ahead and install the rings on the pistons. Now, it's really important that you don't twist this ring and put it on. I've seen so many videos on YouTube where they're just rolling these rings on and twisting them around. That is absolutely the wrong way to do that. I've even had guys argue with me about that and say that, well, I know race teams that do that and this and that. That all well be, may be, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you twist this ring and roll it on, you're taking years of life off of that ring and every ring manufacturer in the world will tell you that that's true. So um, we're gonna do this the right way. If, if you wanna do it some other way and compromise the life of your engine, that's on you, but I'm not gonna say that that's okay. So let's go ahead, we'll start with number one here and I'm gonna show you how we put these rings on. So we wanna start with the oil ring. The oil ring has an expander. Now, the one thing that we have to make sure that we, we understand here on this type of piston, when you have a stroker piston where the pin bore encompasses part of that oil ring, there is a steel spacer that has to be installed in that location. Now, in this case, Weisco calls this a groove lock spacer ring. 
And so we're going to install this in the orientation that they ask us to. So they give you some instructions in here, and I want to read this to you because this is pretty important. Now there is a, a dimple on this. They've actually added a little dimple right there. I don't mean you to see it, but there's a, there's a dot or a notch or a dimple there. And if you read the instructions, it says install the groove lock spacer in the oil ring groove, right, of the piston and slide to the bottom of the groove. The dimple must be orientated downward, that's that little dimple, and over the wrist pin hole. With the dimple facing down over the wrist pin hole, the gap will be 90 degrees from the wrist pin. And you're gonna install the oil ring, ring groove set on top of this. So if we take a look at this, we've got this now it's okay to roll this ring on. I know I told you earlier, don't ever roll these on. These are actually spring steel and so you can bend these. Now we've got this dimple here and what we want is we want that dimple right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and position this with the dimple facing down. So I've got the ring, the, the ring on there and it says to pull it down to the bottom of the ring groove. So what you wanna just, you wanna just pull that all the way down. Now if you look here, my dimple is right here. It's facing down and it's right here in this pin bore area. That's the way that they want this orientated. You can see that our, if you rotate this over, you can see that our gap here, I'll pull that down, right there is 90 degrees from the wrist pin. So you wanna pull this all the way down till it's flush all the way around. So once you got your oil ring spacer on there, like that, and the dimple is here, the gap is 90 degrees, then we can go ahead and put, this is our expander, so we can put our expander on there. And the expander fits right in there. And then we have a couple of scraper rails that go with that expander. And we don't wanna line the scrapers up with the expander gap, we wanna go to just this side of it. So this goes on the bottom and you just run this around. And again, these are spring steel, so you can roll these on. They're not like the compression rings. They're not steel or cast iron or whatever. So you wanna get that bottom oil scraper in there right on top of your spacer. And then the top spacer, we wanna to go to the other side of the piston and get the gap away from that one. And we wanna go ahead and start that in the top and just roll it around now your oil ring should move. The spacer is not gonna move because it has a dimple, but the oil ring should move as one. And that is the installation of the oil ring. Make sure it's not overlapped or anything. It's gotta, it's got, once it's in there correctly, it's gonna move as one when you do this. You can see that that thing's moving as one and that is the correct installation. Now, as far as the compression rings go, we are going to use ring expander pliers. I like to use this set here because it's spring loaded and it really is hard to break the ring with it. Now, as far as your rings go, the rings we're using make it really easy because we have molybdenum or molly rings. If you look at the edge of the rings here, you can see the, the second ring is kind of a dull cast color. The top ring has a shiny silvery tint to it. That is your molly ring. The molly ring goes in the top, and if the ring has the word top or a dot on it, the dot always goes up. Now we have a dot on our ring right there, so our top ring is gonna go up. But we wanna put the second ring on first. When you put these rings on, always go oil, second, top, so you don't stretch the rings over the others. Now if we look at our second ring here, I'm looking for a dot and the second ring does have a dot, right? It has a dot, so we gotta make sure that that dot goes up. So we're gonna put our ring into our ring expander pliers, just like so. Right, so we can expand them, making sure that my dot is facing up, and it is. And we're gonna expand this just enough to get it over the piston. You don't wanna go any further than that. And get it into that second groove, kinda of line it up with your second groove there, and boom, your ring is installed. We're gonna go ahead and do the same thing with the top ring. We're gonna put these in our expander pliers and we're gonna make sure that the dot is facing 
upwards here, and it is, it's right there. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our piston, we're gonna span this just enough to get it over the piston, get it into that top groove, and voila, you have installed your rings. Now, you have a couple of end gaps here that we checked. When we actually put this in the engine, we're gonna stagger these gaps. We're gonna leave one here, and we're gonna to go to the other side. You don't want those gaps lined up because that's gonna cause blow by. That's ring installation. I am not going to bore you by making you watch me put all eight sets of rings on. That's the procedure. Uh, if you wanna see me do all eight, just rewind what I just did eight times and watch it eight times and then you can. All right, so there we go. That is our number one piston. I'm gonna off camera get the rest of them on and then we will move on and get this turkey together.